make him want to turn the page. The eternal question in all fiction is, what happens next? Now, when I started to write comics, I drew each page out by hand. Uh, and I made it up as I went along. Uh, I don't do that anymore, now I outline extensively, but at the time it worked, and it probably would still work, because when I envision a story, I envision it as a whole, as a dynamic narrative with a beginning, a middle, and an end. But when you draw the comic out by hand yourself as you're writing it, you learn pacing, uh, you learn how much the page will bear, how much illustration it will bear, and you're always thinking, what happens next? What happens in the next panel? How will it advance the story? Because everything you put into that comic is to advance the story. Uh, now, as I said, a story is a dynamic narrative with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And by dynamic, I mean that things change. The hero is in peril. The hero discovers great success. Uh, or as Al Zuckerman put it in writing the blockbuster novel, you have to think of your story as a football game between the sainted Packers and the hated Bears. <laughs> now in the first quarter, the hated Bears drive the Packers down to the right at in front of their end zone. And it looks bad. It looks like the, the Bears are going to score. But there's a turnover on the next play, and then the Packers drive the Bears down to their end zone. So that's what I mean by a dynamic narrative. Things are constantly in flux, and this is how you create suspense. Uh, when you sit down to write a comic, I always encourage people to outline. I didn't do this myself for many years, but I do it now, because you want to know where your story is going. Uh, this does not mean that the outline has to be exhaustive. Ken Follett, who wrote Pillars of the Earth, is a famous British novelist, his outlines are over 100 pages long. Now, it works for him, obviously, because he's a great bestseller, but I feel that uh, in order for you to surprise a reader, you have to surprise yourself. Uh, and you do that sometimes by putting in elements that seem right at the moment, but you don't know where they're going. And then you get 20 pages down the road, and you remember that character you introduced on page three, and that character you introduced on page three becomes the key to solving the puzzle or the whole story. So remember that. If you don't surprise yourself, you won't surprise the reader. So always re leave room for spontaneity. Uh, now, the comics are an infinitely elastic form, and by that, I mean, you can have a panel, you can have your full page panel, which is devoted to one scene. Now, if you read comics, and you're familiar with commercial comics, you know how often people do that. Uh, it used to be that every comic uh, opened with a splash page, uh, and it was an entire page devoted to a single image, uh, often dynamic, like the X-Men uh, fighting the crawl, uh, to draw you into the story. Uh, now, these days, uh, comics suffer from what I call decompression, and that means that instead of telling a story in 22 pages like they used to, they will tell a story in 112 pages, the same story, and they spread it out, and they do this by putting one or two panels per page, uh, and often that space is wasted. Whenever I turn a, uh, open a comic and I see the entire page devoted to a head, a talking head saying things or delivering a lecture with a thousand words of text, I'm saying to myself, well, this, this is just a waste of your resources. Uh, now, those of you who read old Marvel comics, uh, the Stanley Jack Kirby comics, will recall that every page had nine panels uh, for the most part. And now, there are always exceptions to this when you get to the, to the big explosion or Hulk smash. Uh, but they knew how to tell a lot of story. Most of those panels weren't wasted. They did advance the story. Such is not the case today. So if you're planning to do a comic, you have to get a feel for how much weight each page will sustain. And of course, that depends on your story. And when you're planning your pages and you're planning the outline, uh, you have to keep in mind the rhythm and the pulse of the story. A good story is like a pop song. It's got a tonic, and then it's got a bridge, and then it's got a hook. And by that, I mean in the blues, it's, it's the first, fourth, and fifth chord. Da 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 da
That's a fifth chord. And when they're arranged in that way, they satisfy the tension created by the first and the fourth chord. Uh, and a story has to be the same way. You have to create tension, and you do that by putting your characters in peril or introducing an element of the unknown, and then you have to resolve that tension later down the road, which doesn't mean it's the end of the story. It just means that that stanza is complete. Uh, I decry this ten trend towards decompression in comics. Uh, I know from experience that you can tell a richly satisfying story in 24 pages, beginning, middle, and end, done. And most comics used to be like that. It's only within the last, oh, I would say, uh, 20 to 30 years that comics became unending serials. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that because uh, American culture loves the serial. You go back to the old RKO serials like uh, Flash Gordon or, or Lash and Lou, and the point was to get the reader to tune, or the viewer to tune in next week, or to listen, because a lot of that was on radio. And of course, that brings us back to the essential question in all fiction is, what happens next? Uh, when when uh, Jim Shooter uh, was in charge of Marvel, uh, he put out uh, a U-case, which is a, a, uh, an order from on high, to all his writers and artists, and he said, each page will consist of eight symmetrical panels. There will be no exceptions. Uh, now that kind of puts a straitjacket on your modern comic artist who likes to blow that up and, and, and do crazy things with layouts. Uh, but it did not in any way diminish the writer's ability to tell the story. Because then you would come to the page where all of a sudden uh, Avengers headquarters blows up. And you go to Jim and say, Big Jim, you know, we're going to blow up Avengers headquarters, so I have to squeeze it into an eighth of the page. He says, No, 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 that you can use the whole page for. Now, my, my own opinion is explosions are very boring. Uh, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. And if you read comics, You've seen those explosions time and again. How many of you do read comics? All right, we've got a bunch of comic readers here. Uh, when I say the page is infinitely malleable, I mean you don't have to limit yourself to eight panels. Uh, for a while there, comic book artists were in competition to see who could draw the page with the most panels. And I think Jim Starlin won that with a 32-page panel, but that doesn't mean that, that somebody can't go in and, and do something else. Now, all those images did not really advance the story. Some of them were just for the sake of symbolism. And of course, if you have 32 panels, it doesn't leave much room for words, which uh, brings us to the question, well, how many words do you commit to a page? How many words is it comfortable uh, for, for the character to spout or the caption to say. And that's strictly a matter of experience and learning and feeling and getting a feel for the story. But the most important dictum in any visual art, and this is true of, of prose as well, is to show, don't tell. Now we've all read comics that show Sir Isaac Newton sitting beneath the apple tree and the apple bobs him on the head. The caption says, an apple falls from the tree and hits Sir Isaac Newton on the head. And Sir Isaac Newton says, oh, an apple has just hit me in the head. Well, that's redundant, and comics are filled with that. You have to be careful for that. And that's why you want to think of your comic as a movie on paper. If this were a movie, how would they show it? Uh, now, there are a couple of shows that I think uh, answer that question beautifully. One of them is Better Call Saul. If you ever watch Better Call Saul, you know how they will often start out with a wordless sequence that will go on for five or six minutes. And you're fascinated by what they're doing. And when they come to the end of that sequence, you realize the point of it. And say, wow, that's good storytelling. Uh, there's a classic Western called Rio Bravo, starring John Wayne and Dean Martin. And it starts in a bar uh, with the guys being rowdy, and Dean Martin comes in, he's obviously he's shaking, he's shaking because he needs a drink so bad, he's looking around, and he's going like this, and uh, the bad guy at the bar takes out a, a 50 cent piece and holds it up, and then he flips it into a spittoon, and Dean Martin goes, 
but he wants that drink so bad. He gets down on his knees and he reaches into the spittoon. Just then, John Wayne appears and kicks the spittoon out of his hands because he doesn't want to see his friend humiliated like that. Then John Wayne gets up and turns his back and Dean is so furious, he gets up and he slugs John Wayne. Uh, this goes on for five minutes and there's a bit there too where, where uh, another guy comes up to the, the flipper, the bad guy who flipped the coin in the spittoon and he says, hey, why'd you have to do that? And the flipper shoots him in the gut. And you have the whole premise of the movie laid out with virtually no words. In fact, I don't think he, he the, the guy says, why did you do that? He just taps him on the shoulder and the bad guy shoots him in the gut. And there's the whole beginning of the story, the setup and the conflict right there. Because John Wayne, as the marshal, has to arrest that guy, whose buddy is a big landlord and a bad guy, uh, and he has to resurrect his pale Dean, who's shaken so bad he can't hold a pistol. And you see all the conflicts laid out there. Uh, and you can do that in a comic. Now, in my opinion, a comic without any words is not a good idea. And I've seen many of them over the years. Uh, and the reason is, even though you can tell a story there, and you leave uh, all the questions of motivation and, and philosophy to the reader, and the reader will supply those on his own, they simply take too little time to read. They don't slow you down. And that's why uh, a good comic is a mix of, of words and pictures together, which make you think, which make you pause. Uh, now, even the best 24-page comic can be read in 15 minutes. But if it's a good comic, you're going to want to read it over and over again. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, I was so fascinated by the arts and some of my famous favorite artists that even when I finished the comic, I would go back and go through it page by page and just marvel at the art in each, in each panel and just say, wow, you know, that's so beautiful. He captures uh, uh, that likeness in, in, so, in so little strokes with such little effort. And of course, uh, that's the goal of, of good fiction and good comics is to transmit the, massive, the, the maximum amount of information that you can with a minimal effort, and that doesn't mean you're scrimping. It just means that, that the graphic arts are a wonderful shorthand if you know how to use them. Uh, and you're familiar with the great uh, graphic artists from uh, Jack Kirby to Mike Mignola who draws Hellboy. Uh, and if you, a lot of people love Hellboy. Hellboy is probably the most successful horror comic there is, although there's nothing horrible about it. Uh, then how many of you read Hellboy? How many of you? Yeah, well you know what I mean then. When you read that Hellboy, and you see what Mike does with so, with, with very little drawing, but he suggests so much. And that's one way to do it. <clears throat> of course, there are other artists who uh, are floored. They will fill each panel to the brim. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, depending on the story, that can be appropriate. The type of story that you're telling uh, requires uh, an art style uh, that's appropriate. Uh, if you're doing Casper the Friendly Ghost, you're not going to do super realistic art. You're going to do stuff that looks like Disney animation. People love Disney animation. In fact, one of the reasons that uh, I got into comics was my fascination with Uncle Scrooge comics. There was one guy who did all those comics. His name was Carl Barks. He was a great genius. Uh, and he had a, a, a profound understanding of story, story dynamics, and his ability to delineate character, not just through words, but with actions, with a gesture and a look. Uh, and Barks would often uh, draw eight panels to a page until he came to a big scene. And then he would devote half the page to the big scene and have four panels below to carry it on. Uh, which I thought was, was a wonderful way to do it because it didn't stop the book right there, the big scene. It stopped you long enough to look at that big scene. The big scene was often uh, archeological or architectural. Uh, Barks never left his home in, in uh, Washington State, but he subscribed to National Geographic and he was fascinated with archeological digs and he would set his stories all over the world. Uh, the Andes, uh, the Sahara, the Far East, and he would 
uh, take the images he saw in National Geographic and render them lovingly with exquisite detail, but not, not so much detail that the image disappeared. It was just an image that smacked you in the face and said, wow, he nailed that pyramid. And then, of course, there are the tiny little ducks climbing the pyramid uh, and juxtaposing the, the, uh, the size of the ducks with the size of the pyramid would give you uh, 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 the scale of the story he was, he was telling, the scope of the scale. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, in a comic, uh, wait, wait for it. <laughs> uh, you have to get a feel uh, for how much uh, the, the comic will bear. And when you draw each page out by hand, and uh, most good comic artists thumbnail beforehand, and by that I mean they do a little sketch of what the page will look like, and sometimes the art is quite proficient, but it doesn't have to be. It can be little stick figures. Archie Goodwin, the great editor and writer, would write that way. He'd draw each page out. And when you look at one page that he drew, it would have all the action, all the scenes, all the points of view, all the dialogue, and all the captions. But it didn't have any explanations, because what he drew explained everything. <clears throat> now, uh, nowadays, we call a big, expensive comic a graphic novel. A graphic novel. Uh, and, uh, that's an art form in itself. Uh, the big companies like Marvel or DC will, will take six or seven or 10 issues and package it all together and call it a graphic novel. Well, it's not really a graphic novel, it's a compilation. But if you look at the undergrounds, uh, the work of uh, uh, Bill Griffith or Spain Rodriguez, um, who's a great artist, uh, and uh, the undergrounds are no, are no longer with us, but right now graphic novels are flourishing as never before. Uh, the New York Times pays attention to them because the stories are often uh, personal uh, and they span a lot of time and space, like uh, Palestine by Joe Sacco. Joe Sacco went to Palestine, uh, he observed it, he sketched like crazy while he was there, and finally he put out this graphic novel about the plight of the Palestinians. And, uh, it had the stink of truth about it. You could tell it, you, you know, when you, when you read it, you just say, you know this guy was there. Uh, and Bill Griffith, uh, who's famous mostly for Zippy the Pinhead. Has anyone here heard of Zippy the Pinhead? Yes. Well, he put out a graphic novel about his mother's lifelong affair with a famous cartoonist. Uh, I can't remember the title, I have the book at home, but it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and if you read Zippy the Pinhead, you may not realize what a good draftsman Bill Griffith really is, but he's a tremendous draftsman and, and uh, he has a lot of power in his art. Uh, now, of course, here's a, here's a sad truth about comics is that you can tell a great story, but if it's accompanied by bad art, people aren't gonna get through it. It's gonna be a struggle unless you're Alan Moore or somebody. Uh, it's, comics are a visual medium and it's important that you, that your art appeal to the reader, that the reader looks at the art and sees something in the art in and of itself that makes him want to read more. And we all have our favorite comic artists uh, who do that. Uh, because uh, the question uh, of, of the comic art is, uh, is it appropriate to the story? Does it dazzle? If there were no words on that page, would you want that art hanging on your wall? Uh, now, if you're gonna draw uh, modern comics in a realistic manner, uh, you have to master human anatomy and perspective. There's just no two ways about it. Now, that doesn't mean that all comics have to be like that. Uh, I've seen a lot of very effective comics that are fairly crudely drawn. They're not ugly, there's an aesthetic to them. All you have to do is look in the newspaper strip and, and hang on the horrible, or, or peanuts for that matter. Uh, or, uh, uh, what's Trudeau's strip called? Doonesbury. Doonesbury? Doonesbury, right. Now these guys are not great artists. They're not great draftsmen. But they have a style that's consistent. And it's that consistency 
that keeps you coming back, as well as what they have to say. Now, I think people read Doonesbury uh, because they like what Tudo has to say. They, that, uh, they get their uh, uh, bias confirmation from reading Doonesbury. Uh, but today, so many of the newspaper strips just go for a single gag. In fact, so many strips are just a single panel, like Bizarro, uh, very funny guy. But uh, back in the heyday, comics uh, grew up out of the newspapers. Uh, and the very first comic character was called The Yellow Kid. And the reason it was called The Yellow Kid was they had all this newsprint they had to fill. And they said, you know, hey, Bob, can you draw something for this? And he did, and they had all this yellow ink left over. So The Yellow Kid <clears throat> was colored yellow, and that's how The Yellow Kid was born. Uh, but then, uh, the publishers realized that there was money in Lind on Hills. Uh, not much, but, but there was. And so you had the rise of, of dedicated comic book publishers. Uh, but before that, they were always in the newspaper strips. And the newspaper strips were, were huge. Where's that, uh, where's that Nexus thing? Yeah, uh, pass that around. Now, my partner, Steve Rue, uh, wanted to uh, resurrect the feel of the old style uh, Sunday supplement. And that's why that is the format that it is. Unfortunately, uh, the format is, is uh, uh, very uncommercial. You can't ship it. Comic stores won't rack it because it takes up too much space. But that's what he wanted to do. And that's pretty much what an old Sunday supplement used to look like. Newspapers were much bigger then. And they had huge comics uh, sections. And the comic sections were often dominated by serious adventure strips uh, like Flash Gordon, uh, Buck Rogers, uh, Dick Tracy, Prince Valiant. And people tuned in week after week and month after month to see where the story was going. But as the newspapers uh, got older and they began to print more and more copy, uh, the newspaper strips began to shrink until now they're postage stamped for the most part. Uh, there are a few syndicates that are out there that are still uh, promoting uh, newspaper strips. Uh, and you can find them. I, I haven't looked at the Denver Post recently, but I imagine that they have a funny section. Uh, but when I was growing up, every newspaper had a huge color funny section. And by funnies, I mean uh, cartoons and comic book stories, because they weren't all funny. In fact, the serious stuff used to outnumber the funny stuff. But but these days, the funny stuff outnumbers the serious stuff, and the funny stuff is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. It's only a matter of time before it disappears completely. There is something called the Funnies Weekly to which you can subscribe, and it's a weekly uh, tabloid that reprints many of the classic strips. Uh, they send it to your house every week. Uh, I don't know if they're doing any new material. I doubt that they are because it's cost prohibitive. But right now, uh, the focus is on uh, comic books. Uh, and the world of comic books. But the world of comic books is in free fall right now. Uh, last week, DC announced that they were cutting their line in half. And there's been talk for several years that Marvel is going to stop publishing comics altogether. Now that they have a foot uh, hold in the movies, and the movies are these huge tentpole productions that bring in millions and millions of dollars, and people are aware of the X-Men, are aware of Superman and Wonder Woman because of the movies, not because of the comics. Uh, comics are dying. Comic book stores uh, are shrinking. Uh, we've lost about 400 in the past couple of years. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to Haley's Comics, which is right around the corner on Walnut Street. Please patronize them. And Griffin's at the corner of Shields and Drake. It's one of our other comic <coughs> shops that's hanging on. But like everything else, uh, in order to survive, uh, they've had to vary what they offer. So they bring in a lot of toys and games. For those of you who are interested in doing comics professionally, I will tell you from experience that there's no better way to get in with a major production, a major publisher, than to do your own comic and give it to an editor. And if it's anyway halfway professional, or if you tell an interesting story, they will read it. They're always looking for new talent, despite the shrinkage. But the shrinkage is illusory because there's an alternative market that's springing up all over. I have a friend named Ethan Van Skyver who drew Green Lantern for DC. And one day he, he decided he wanted, he'd had enough. 
uh, and he was going to launch his own title called Cyber Fraud. So he launched a Kickstarter, and he raised over five hundred thousand dollars very recently. And, and I've seen other non-traditional comics do the same thing. There's a great hunger out there for good comics that Marvel and DC are not addressing for various reasons. I won't go into that. Uh, but the alternative comics market is a bull market right now. Uh, and uh, there are companies springing up all over, like Alterna Comics by Peter Cimetti. Uh, they're the mid-level publishers, like Dark Horse, who is my publisher, they publish Nexus, and they will be bringing out a bunch of new material later this year. And then there are the alternative companies that are truly alternative, like Cautionary, of which I'm editor-in-chief, which is going to be uh, bringing out a whole bunch of new titles this year. And we're going to crowdfund them. Uh, what do we offer? We offer dynamic, entertaining stories uh, with real quality art. And the point of these comics is strictly to entertain. That's the number one rule of storytellers. Your job is to entertain, not enlighten or spread a message. You have to entertain. You've got to get butts in the seats in order to sell those comics. The second rule is to show, don't tell. And we've already discussed that. So when you're doing your comic, you think, if this were a movie, how would I do it? Would I explain it? Would I go blah, 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 blah? Or would I show it? You always want to show it if you can. Uh, now, showing often involves words, too. Uh, and just for an example, uh, John was walking down the alley when he was shot in the back. John entered the alley and was immediately aware of the tang of rotten garbage uh, and the many shadowed places lurking at the edge of his eyes. He was almost at the end when it seemed as if a dump truck slammed into his back, smashing him against the red brick wall. And as his cheek slid down to the floor, he felt the ground was a red brick. And lying on the ground, he was aware of uh, a great pain in his back as damp softness spread out around him. And that's the difference between telling and showing. You can show in prose as much as you can in pictures. But comics uh, uh, are uh, a great uh, uh, multiplier of those things because you can draw the picture and show what they're doing. Uh, now, if you're going to do a comic, I've, I've seen many great comics that were just stream of consciousness and God obviously didn't plan them. And, and that, the best example of that is anything Art Crumb has done. If you read Art Crumb, uh, you see that he's just proceeding from panel to panel and making it up as, as he goes along. But Art Crumb is absolutely fearless in that he will not censor himself. And so his thoughts creep out, and they are often perceived as sexist or racist. Uh, or horrifying. He's been banned in Australia, but you have to admire the guy because it's compelling. But if you're telling an adventure story, I urge you to outline the story first. Uh, and uh, I would say that the outline should be entertaining in and of itself. Uh, the outline is an advertisement for the story you're going to draw. And you want people to read the outline and say, oh man, am I interested? I have to get this comic. Uh, and when people ask you what is your story about, you have to be ready, you have to prepare. Uh, for instance, I have uh, a book called Helm Ahead. It's about Nazi biker zombies. That's it, Nazi biker zombies. But those three words trip three triggers in a certain demographic. Nazis, bikers, zombies, I gotta see that. You can't do that for every story. You have to describe the story in such a way as to excite the reader. Uh, later this year, we're going to launch a comic called Florid Man. Gary Dugas having a bad day. There's a snake in his toilet, a rabbit raccoon in the yard, and his girlfriend Crystal has been arrested for getting naked at a Waffle House and licking the manager. <laughs> <laughs> so Gary sets off with his best friend Floyd to sell his prize, Barry Bonds' wiki card, to raise money for bail. But things get out of hand. And when people ask me, well, what's Florida Man about? That's what I say. <laughs> so I'm running out of steam here. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Sir? Um, you talked about uh, the time it takes to read a comic. 
and the avenues that some of these companies are pursuing are going to away from comics almost entirely, or maybe entirely. It just seems to point towards this huge gap between the time it takes to make these worlds and to make them compelling, to make the characters real, and the time it takes for the consumer to consume it. So as consumers get more and more access to the content creation tools themselves, how do you see that interplay working itself out? Is there more of a dialogue coming between comic creators and comic consumers? Is it going to be another side market? You know, are we just going to see alternative alternative comics, fan creations? We are seeing alternative comics, but you remember that the movie that we watched in two hours was in development for a year. It took months and months to film. It probably took months and months just to develop the screenplay. Now, a comic isn't like that, especially if you're hired on to write a monthly comic, and I've done many of them. Uh, you've got to get that script written for the next issue. Uh, but that gives you a month. Uh, and uh, when I'm blazing, I can easily do 10 pages a day. Uh, I recently wrote a complete comic in 24 pages. But that's because I extensively outlined beforehand, and I knew where it was going. So maybe, a, sorry, go for it. Well, I was just going to say, maybe as a follow-up, the line between what is a comic and what is these other forms of media gets blurred and blurrier too. Do you see a definitive line there? Well, yes and no. Uh, when you when I open a graphic novel, even if it's a 180 page masterpiece, uh, it's still the comic book form. But when you get like an illustrated text with text on each page and one illustration, that's something else. That's not a comic. Uh, and when we talk about the synergy between comics and movies and how comics are, are struggling to survive, at least the traditional ones, well, the logical answer is to sell comics in movie lobbies. Uh, we've been talking about this for 30 years. And nobody has done it yet for a variety of reasons. They just can't seem to get it done. But that, to me, would seem to be the solution to increasing the comic book audience. Do you think a GIF in an internet presentation of a comic, or a comic with sound online, is that still a comic? Yes, it is. But that raises an interesting conundrum, because comics traditionally have been portrait format. Uh, but the internet, the computer screen, is landscape format. And a number of comic book creators have adjusted their art to appear in landscape format. Uh, and then the publisher comes along and publishes it in landscape format. Uh, and if you want to know what that looks like, or what a good on-screen uh, comic looks like, Google battlepub.com, battlepub.com. Uh, wonderful art, uh, landscape format, landscape format books. Sir. Um, from the comics that I've seen, I've mostly been dabbling web comics and such. I've seen them instead in not really as much as landscape, but still maintain that classic portrait view. It's just a matter of scrolling down and through. Um, I'm seeing there's a lot of use of web comics. What's your opinion on that? And do you think they are growing where the traditional comics are shrinking because of the younger demographic? Well, uh, they are growing, and uh, but the question is, how do you monetize that? You have to create something so compelling that you get a, enough eyes on that page that you can sell advertising. That's, that's the first way you monetize anything. Now, some of these comics, like Battle Pod, are simply so good, uh, because Mike Norton is a well-known, well-established artist, uh, that Dark Horse is happy to publish his book. Uh, but Dark Horse is a very graphic-oriented company. And by that, I mean they care more about the art than they do about the story. So in some web comics, you usually see Development. A lot of the earlier web comics start off kind of janky in terms of art, but enough that one can suspend their disbelief. But then as they go, you kind of see them evolve at the same time. So it kind of brings up the question is do you need just kind of a basic proficiency in uh, anatomy and kind of techniques? In it depends on the type of story. Okay. Because uh, as I said, uh, Peanuts mm -hmm. or, uh, so, or Mother Goose or any of those cartoony ones. Uh, you can get by with a, with a shorthand if it's clean and professional looking. Mm -hmm. You don't have to master human anatomy. There's something like Little Abner. Uh, El Cap was a master of human anatomy, and, and you can see that looking at his art, that it's much more sophisticated than most straight humor uh, uh, strips. And if you're doing an online comic, uh, 
And I've said this before, if the art is ugly or looks amateurish, you're just gonna lose eyes, you're just gonna slide right off. That doesn't mean it has to be super complicated or, or elegant or traditional. It has to look professional though. And, and we all know what I mean by that. Uh, just look at peanuts again, or, uh, or, or Walt Kelly, uh, Pogo. Uh, Pogo has an aesthetic all its own. You look at a Walt Kelly strip and you know immediately that that's Walt Kelly. Uh, and he's very good at it. I mean, uh, the artist is utterly charming and utterly convincing within its own world. Mm -hmm. so and that's what you want. You have to let the design.